after reading just a few books by William Volman, I decided I wanted to tackle this brick, the 1,400-page 2015 novel, The Dying Grass. Now, this is a long book. It's going to take you a couple of months of your life to read. And is it worth it? That's what I'm going to get into today. The Dying Grass is part of William Volman's Seven Dream series. Each one of these books looks at a specific moment in America's history. The first one I read was The Ice Shirt. And the Ice Shirt, good book, it was mostly like a, almost like a recitation of various Norse myths. Whereas The Rifles defines postmodernist fiction. There are multiple timelines happening, sometimes all on the same page. In a way, this novel reminded me of The Sound and the Fury. In a way that you really had to work to figure out who the characters were and how they were interacting with each other and their past. So I really didn't know what I was getting into when I picked up The Dying Grass. It is a meticulous day-by-day -day recounting of the Nez Perce War, especially two months in 1877, when General Howard pursued the tribe out of Oregon through Montana towards the Canada border. In fact, this book is so meticulous, it's almost tempting to stop seeing it as fiction and start considering it as historical fact. But that's not exactly accurate. Bowman helps you understand that by meticulously sourcing in the endnotes every single page of the book. He talks about how he constructed each scene. Maybe he took a piece of the congressional record, combined it with part of a soldier's diary that he found, and used those elements to create a piece of dialogue or recounting of a specific moment in the conflict. When you first open the book, the first thing you're going to notice is that it is not laid out like a conventional narrative. Instead, the paragraphs and dialogue are sort of chunked out throughout the page, indented seemingly at random. First, I thought, is this some sort of 1,400-page poem? Like, what have I gotten myself into? But that's not what was happening. Instead, what's happening is Woolman is threading the main narrative, usually but not always dialogue, along the left-hand side of the page. And then, in various insets along the way, he's revealing other things that a conventional book could never tell you. Now, this might include the internal monologues of the people having the conversation. It might include historical background or details about the characters, or these indents might have scenes of natural beauty. There's a scene on page 303 in my copy where the U.S. Army is talking about whether they need to cross a river. And in the main narrative, someone says, I suspect Joseph's aim is to humiliate us, sir. He's insulting the U.S. Army. Therefore, therefore, we must cross the river. And then in the inset paragraph, it says, This wide gray and silver river, with its sandy beaches, and then the steep yellow, green, and orange hill, concealing where it cuts into the earth, thus the salmon and its deep canyon. And then in a further indent, he goes into how hard it was for the soldiers themselves to describe this, uh, this scene. Wood, unable even to properly describe the way some clouds resemble pale blue flower cups, has satisfied himself by writing in his diary a foaming torrent rushing through desolation. Now, if this technique sounds super, super difficult to get through, it's not. It took me about 50 pages to pick up. After that, I was reading it just as easily as I was reading a normal novel. I was sort of in awe of how well this technique allowed Volman to create a world that felt almost unbearably nostalgic. It felt like the past and the future and all these characters and all the environment was happening at once in different levels. Instead of reading a narrative, it felt like looking at a painting where you could look at the foreground and then the background and then another background and understand how they all fit together. The other stylistic decision that Volman made was the decision to make this this long. Reading a book this long forces you to spend a lot of time with characters, some of whom lived, some of whom died. Now, I can go possibly through every one, but fortunately, Volman has a, uh, a dramatis personae, a, a glossary in the back, where he talks about every single character. Most of them are real. The ones that are not real, he talks about how he created those actual characters. Three that stood out or that lasted the narrative, you know this because it's history, General Howard, who was, after the Civil War, a key figure in American history, integrating the freed slaves into American culture. How was it that this person who did so many good things with his life, this Christian, spent the last part of his military career participating in this awful event? 
Then there's Lieutenant Wood, who went on to be a fairly famous, apparently, figure in Portland's literary development. He's one of the only characters who has a true literary arc, or character arc, in the book, I would say. He almost stands in for the reader, the person who stands back and looks at the scene and says, how is this right? What are the good parts of all these cultures, and can't we bring them together in some way? And then there is, of course, the legendary Chief Joseph. The book helped me understand him not just as a great leader, but as somebody with just an unbearable amount of nuance. Having to make these decisions about, is it better for this culture to make sure that we survive? To make sure that the people who are trusting me survive? Because this event is only going to end one way. And then on the other side, looking at his war chiefs, looking at the braves, who say it is better to fight, to be part of the dying grass, and then disappear forever. That would be better than the fate that Howard and the U.S. Army have laid out for us. And several times, the length of this book almost seems like a direct challenge to you, the reader. It's challenging you to ask yourself, why are you spending this much of your life on this finite piece of history? What is the value of actually learning history? And of the, I mean, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cultures that have come and gone and disappeared like the dying grass, which of those cultures live on? Which of them fade away, but their stories and their rituals live on? And which ones disappear forever? Throughout the Seven Dreams series, and definitely in The Dying Grass, there are multiple scenes where indigenous people trade things that matter. Food, shelter, peace, knowledge. And they trade these things for a scrap of red cloth, a shiny button, whiskey, tobacco. But then you think, is this unique to this situation? Because don't we all know people who are maybe trading something right now that matters? Their attention, their savings, healthy food, for things that, in the long run, don't really matter. There's a moment at the end of this book where Volman seems to reach through his characters directly to the reader. Say, now that you understand the sweep of history, now that you have looked these terrifying questions in the eye, I am warning you, you probably will never find the answers. In fact, it is far more likely that you will get distracted by something else in your life. It is far more likely that you will simply close the book.